the button on the front. Welcome to Spotlight. I'm Ryan Keating. Today we're delighted to have one of Broadway's finest singers, a woman who can be heard on the original cast recordings of Company, A Little Night Music, and The Baker's Wife. It's a pleasure to welcome Terry Ralston. Terry, welcome. Do you Thank know, I've you. been a fan of yours since I was 14. When I, I, I don't mean to make you feel like Methuselah. <laughs> no, I'm used to that. I'm used to that. But uh, I had bought a little night music, and uh -huh. uh, I just fell in love with it. That's it's a beautiful you, album. I bought it because it, I didn't know anything about it. It just had such an attractive record jacket with all those naked people in the tree. <laughs> I know. <laughs> and I it know. opened up a whole new world for me. <laughs> you got educated from I the album. I certainly did. You had just uh, done another Stephen Sondheim musical on the West Coast, a revival of Follies. Oh, just now. Oh, you bet. I just did Follies which was wonderful. Um, it's the first major production of Follies, really. I mean, I think it's the first major one since, since the Broadway show because it's so big to mount, you know, mm -hmm. such a big, big show to do, and it's so difficult. So they did it at San Jose Civic Light Opera, and it was quite an event. Harvey Evans, who was the young buddy, now played the old buddy. I played the old Sally. Um, and Gretchen Weiler mm -hmm. played Phyllis, and Sam Stoneburner played Ben. And uh, it was just a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful production. Uh, the San Francisco Papers came down, and, you know, they, they did follow-up write-ups. Did you read any of those? No. They, they blamed San Francisco uh, Theater for not doing more, you know, taking chances like they did at San Jose, and, and it, it was just beautiful. It was like a giant tease, though, because you don't get to do that kind of theater very much anymore. But what a wonderful role. Yes, now yes. When, when this had first opened, the, the main gripes with the critics were with the book. You know what? The book works so well, you wouldn't believe it. It's, um, they did criticize the book, and what was interesting, well, all of Sondheim's shows tend possibly are ahead of their time, certainly mm -hmm. the company was. I think. Um, it was ahead of its time, and what proved to be true, the audiences absolutely loved it. I mean, this time around, you know, I mean, it got, uh, I, I think it made a little more sense to a lot of people than maybe it did 15 years ago. They loved it. It was interesting. I went to the library to do my research, and yeah. uh, Time Magazine had Alexa Smith on the cover. They said, in 15 years, it will just, it would go over so well. No kidding. That's, oh God, and here it is, 15 years. It was so wild doing it because it's about nostalgia. And of course, you know, here we are all 15 years later. It was about a 30-year reunion. Mm -hmm. But, isn't that right? Isn't it 30 yes, years? Yes, it's 30. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very tired. I've been running around New York. My mind isn't totally, I keep losing thoughts. I keep, to, I keep talking to my friends because I, well, well, I'll tell you all about that, but I've been in New York after having been away for two years. I've been, and I keep talking to friends and what was I saying? I'm losing thoughts. So 30 I, years, Terry. <laughs> yes, okay, thank you. 30 years, about 30 years. And this was a 15-year reunion. Harvey playing now the old band and he mm -hmm. was the young band. And um, I had seen uh, uh, Stephen Sondheim, uh, I went down to see Into the Woods in San Diego, and, and uh, Judy Prince was there, and she said that she and Stephen were saying, oh, my God, Terry Ralston is now playing grown-up parts. You know, <laughs> here I am playing the old Sally. And when I was doing, well, when Dorothy Collins first left, a little, uh, left Follies, <laughs> Dorothy Collins was in Follies, no? and when she first left it, Hal Prince got an idea that maybe I, should take over for her. And he called from Mallorca and said, try to get Terry to see if we can make her look old enough. Mm -hmm. Well, I was still in my 20s. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was a, a, a bit of a stretch. And, uh, but we did. We got me a little Dorothy Collins wig, and, and I put this little dress on, and I went in to audition for it. And... Uh, Nobody recognized me, you know, and I, I was doing a little night music at the time. And mm -hmm. the stage manager and everyone came up and said they didn't know who I was. And I walked out on stage and Hal said, hi, Terry. And I, <laughs> I said, how did you know it was me? And he said, I'd recognize that walk anywhere. You know, so I auditioned for it, but I indeed was not old enough. We just couldn't pull that one off. So it's neat that 15 years later. Then and I've still, got, I've still got quite a few years, and I can, I'm, <laughs> I'm still not the age. Mm -hmm. And I have a few years I can do that yet, which is great. I mean, I can still do Sally. You know, I hope they keep doing it. You know, a lot of the, a lot of, uh, the theater owners 
uh, and artistic directors all around the country came in to see this production in San Jose because they're starting to do it everywhere now. Of course, they're doing it in London, as you know. Mm -hmm. They've rewritten it. And they're doing, uh, Stephen's written, I think, four new songs for it. And that's going to be very exciting, too. I think there's going to be interesting if they both keep going. I know? hope so, because yeah. it's such wonderful music. Oh, it's wonderful. It's now, wonderful. The original production had been budgeted at $660,000, which today, how much do you think it would cost to... Because you just saw Starlight Express, <sighs> which was $8 million. I See, I can't even think... Of all those zeros, it doesn't. It, it, it's it, it's a foreign language to me. I, I can't. I can't even. I can't. Re, I even relate to that. What would it cost today? I I haven't the vaguest idea. I know in San Jose, I think they budgeted at a quarter of a million, which you know for mm -hmm. for uh, now that's a that was a twenty seven hundred seat house. So the fact that the, I think that's what a quarter of a million, which is a lot for for. Uh, well, it's not a regional theater, but it's a, it's a civic light opera mm -hmm. theater. Uh, if they were going to open it on Broadway today, it would certainly cost three, four million, I suppose. I mean, Starlight Express is something else. I mean, that's just all you see is money. You know, you just look and you see money. My God, that must have cost a lot. My God. And in the you know in the lobby, it cracks me up. There's a, you know the big poster in the lobby says. Their advert set two and a half million dollars. That's what they're advertising. <laughs> Two and a half million. Well, they must be very proud. <laughs> they want oh, you to well. know your ticket is... <laughs> yeah, yeah. They're not charging anymore. Everyone's afraid, I guess, to go up to the $50 mark. Everyone's still charging their forty-seven fifty. Well, we'll have to wait for Phantom of the Opera. And see but you know what they do. I, I thought, um, I'm, I'm going to, I heard you should sit up high for, for a Starlight, so I got, um, I was going to just get one of the cheaper tickets. So... I got a forty dollar ticket, but I thought, okay, a forty dollar ticket, that's gonna be that's gotta be a trip. They have one row of thirty two dollar tickets. I mean, that made me mad. You know, they advertise forty seven most of the theater is forty seven mm -hmm. fifty and then they give you two rows in the theater to thirty two dollars and then maybe a couple of rows at forty dollars. <laughs> so I had played forty dollars, I was in the second to the last row. But anyway, that's a place to see Well, I from. feel, Jip. So you were here for two weeks. What else have you seen? <laughs> You're OD'd. <laughs> oh, my God. I'm going to go home. Absolutely. It, I have been overly stimulated. I'm, I, I, ha I am embarrassed to say I have not been here in two years because New York is, is home, too. I mean, I, I come here, and it's like I never left. But I haven't actually been here in two and a half years, uh, luckily because I've been you know, real busy out, out on the West Coast. But, um, whoops, my goodness here. <laughs> I know it's cable, but <laughs> let's fix this here. We're not <laughs> I know you told me I could take off my clothes and do all that. You can that. say anything you like, any language. They have a blue but dot. But I think we'll, oh, the blue dot. We weren't at the blue dot yet here. <laughs> anyway, um, I haven't been here two years. So there's, I mean, I, you know, I hadn't been back since Big River. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I had all of these things because I want to see everything. And I've got friends in everything. And uh, I've seen 15 shows. And, and mostly everything, I mean, not everything has been wonderful, and, but, you know, I, there were two or three clinkers that I won't mention. A lot of 15, that's very good. You bet. And, you know, they talk about, they talk about you know, theater is dying, and, and uh, certainly a, a lot of people are moving to, to, to California. And, you know, California is wonderful. I, I, it, it's, we tend to always apologize for having moved to California. Mm -hmm. it, we always feel a little like, you know, like we need to apologize for that. I really love living out there, but, but uh, I'm, I, this time particularly I really feel I'm ready to come back and do a show again or, or come back, you know, spend a couple of months. You know, you cannot get, you can't leave New no. York. You cannot leave New York. But anyway, yes, I've seen... Just about I, everything on Broadway, really, and and there's so much off Broadway. Uh, I did see Nonsense today, and so I'm all, <laughs> all. It's what a good thing to come to before an interview. I loved it so much. Now you spent your formative years in California. And I consider my formative years in New York really. I mean, I consider twenties formative. So are, you're forming right now. Right? You're in your formative years. <laughs> well, that's good news. <laughs> I consider my 20s the most uh, influential in my life. I, um, I was actually born in Colorado, mm -hmm. in, in a little cow town, which is really neat because I have a very basic beginning, you know, literally, <laughs> I, I had a horse, and I still have a horse. Those, you know, those, those beginning years stay with you. Um, 
I moved to Laguna Beach, which is paradise. You know, mm -hmm. it really is incredible. Uh, at the age of 12, and I was very starstruck. I, I don't know how that happened that I was so starstruck because in Holyoke, we had a movie theater that often was out of business. I mean, my church even went out of business. <laughs> and I'm a Presbyterian. I mean, <laughs> that should be the popular church in town. But it, it, it was, a, you know, a lot of wheat farming and you know mm -hmm. you'd have a bad year and everything would go out of, out of business my dad was a doctor so he never you know he kept busy he delivered all the babies and you know was a coroner but even the movie theater went out of business sometimes so how you get that instilled in you is fascinating to me because i at the age of eight was writing letters to movie stars and asking for autograph you know pictures and things and uh, so then when we moved to laguna we moved to a house right on the beach and the first day that we were in our house, we walked out on our little balcony, and which was, you know, right on the water. I mean, it was mm -hmm. quite an incredible move from the plains of Colorado. And up from the beach come walking Sterling Hayden and Ann Baxter. And they had just filmed a movie that really, On the Beach was the name of it. But I just really thought I had died and gone to heaven. I mean, 12 years old, my first day in, in California, and here comes Ann Baxter. Oh, wonderful. Oh, it was great. It was great. So that, that uh, I thought it was a sign, it was a sign. And I started acting when I was 12. I started studying in Laguna. And but you were the star on the top of the Christmas tree, if I'm oh, not that was still in Oh, <laughs> that was still in Colorado. Oh, wow. Yes, yes. I, I <laughs> always sang, and they, I guess when I was about the sixth grade, they came to me and asked me to be the star. And uh, I sang Oh, Holy Night, which was quite a song for a... For a 12-year-old. No, I think it was 10, actually. <laughs> Yeah, I sang all those high notes then, and that, yeah, that 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 really caught me. The the bug was was mm -hmm. caught with the start. Now, one of your the first theater team. roles was uh, Louisa in the Fantastics. Well, was it? Um, it was my first equity job. Louisa was my first equity job. Uh, actually, my first role was in Ghost in the Green Gown. <laughs> but you, you know, that's don't, not in the books. That. That's not in the books. So, but that was that was very. Yes, that was in Laguna Beach at the Laguna Playhouse. Uh, it's wild because the, the it, it, you know everything is circular. Everything comes around, and comes around, and and uh, yes, I, I was actually in college uh, and was asked to do the Fantastics, and that's one of those shows that I had seen, and I said I have to do that role because mm -hmm. that's you know we were all so impressed with that was one of the things that we had to do, and so they asked me to do it at, at Laguna. I went back to my hometown. And did uh, the ghost in the green? Uh, no, no, I'd done that. I'd done that. See, it's been a long couple of weeks. Um, did the Fantastics, and then I went up to do it in San Francisco, and that's how I got my equity card. So that was my first mm -hmm. uh, equity job, and yeah, one of my first things. You'd also done another well-known off-Broadway review, Jacques Brel, which you did here. Yeah, yeah. I, I actually. Uh, I was one of those really lucky people. I, I cannot say I never, I did not suffer, you know, in the, I, I suffered later. <laughs> I suffered later. We'll get to I'm that. I'm still suffering. Um, no, I, I really have had a blessed, blessed, blessed um, career. Uh, I was doing, right after I graduated from college in San Francisco, I got into, actually I was singing at the Purple Onion, and uh, a friend came and who was in uh, uh, your own thing came and saw me and had the people come see it. Mm -hmm. I'll make this fast. This is all boring. Uh, I, you know, they, I think it's always well, it's interesting to know how people get into yes. it. But then, you know, so I'll make it fast. Um, so I did your own thing. They asked me to do it, and I went and saw it, not having, you know, I was already cast, not having seen it. And there was this very sexy terrific dancing person doing the role that I had just been cast. This big German woman, and I. I can't do that. I, and I'd already, agree, you know, they'd already cast me. But anyway, Rudy Toronto, who's uh, who directed, um, you know, uh, Sugar Babies, uh, was directing the productions, and and he was so patient and wonderful, and and he put me into the show. And at that point, I had finished college and had gotten my teaching credentials. I was always going to be a teacher, so. Um, I was substitute teaching during the day and doing your own thing at night, and I was trying to save money because I wanted to come to New York. Mm -hmm. And I'd go in, you know, to teach high school, and 
since when you substitute teach, you, you're called in for everything. I mean, I go in to teach PE or driver's education. <laughs> oh, I was terrible. Dri driver's education. I took this kid on a on the freeway for his first time. Here, I'm the teacher. I said, uh -huh. Watch out! <laughs> 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 The poor kid. I, I'm amazed we weren't in, you know, in an accident. That's worse than a mother taking a kid. Oh, out. <laughs> oh! I was terrible. I was just terrible. But I would go in to teach, and I was I was playing Olivia, who falls in love with this younger man. Very interesting. Um, Olivia was supposed to be 30 years old, and I I um, at the time was 22, and I I have see I'm getting on all these tangents. Um, <laughs> Help me not lose thoughts. Um, anyway, I was playing. I played older. Mm -hmm. You know, I played thirty. Even and, then. Even yeah. then, I've sort of every. You know, I, I'm getting to my ages before I get to them along the way. Mm -hmm. It's one wonderful thing about doing plays. I'll get back to that. Anyway, your own thing then took me to New York, Philadelphia. I went to Philadelphia with it. I came into town and saw um, Jacques Brel, and I was very naive. I didn't know any better, and I looked up the stage manager's name because again. Fantastics was the first show that I said I have to do. Then I saw Jacques Brel. I said, I have to do Jacques Brel. So I called uh, the stage manager, got an audition, and was cast in, uh, in, in that. Um, and then it was going to California, so I went out and alternated with Ellie Stone uh, at the Huntington Hartford. Met George Firth uh, at a club, which was the Ye Little Club. Mm -hmm. And he said, are you... In sh you know, are you an actress? And I said, yes. And he says, you, I think you're very right for a play I've just written. I said, yeah. Sure, <laughs> oh, that's sure. the if oldest you, line. If you think so, you can come see me do Jacques Brel tomorrow. So he came and saw me do Jacques Brel and uh, wrote to Hal Prince and said, I think I found Jenny, which was, of course, for company. And I still, you know, I just took that all with a grain of salt and uh, went up to San Francisco then to open Jacques Brel. And decided that, you know, I'd gotten my feet wet in New York because I'd already done Jacques mm -hmm. Brel in New York. You got to do it for Jacques Brel in New York. Yes, when I came back. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I left it in San Francisco and then I came back uh, because I just wanted to come on back to New York. And then about that time, Jacques Brel indeed did come to America for the first no, time. No, he had procrastinated seeing that show for a long time. Yeah, yeah, politically. He did not want to come to America. He didn't like what was going on at all. And... Uh, that was very exciting. Ellie Stone did, of course, the first part, and I did the second mm -hmm. part. And I think Joe Maziel did one of the men, and I think uh, J.T. Cromwell. I think. It was, it was a long time ago, but we did it for him the first time he saw it, and that was very exciting. He kissed me on the cheek. <laughs> it was wonderful. It was great. So then I got company. You know, I was doing Jacques Brel, and I was, I was having such a wonderful time doing... Brell that I almost didn't take company. I was real naive. I, I hadn't done it very long. I, mm -hmm. I want to keep doing this, and so I almost didn't do company. And uh, people said, no, no, <laughs> this is going to be wonderful. So I continued doing uh, Jacques Brel at night while I was rehearsing company, and Hal Prince would get, you know, because he kept saying, more energy, more energy, because, mm -hmm. I, and I, you shouldn't be doing that show at night, you know. And he was, but anyway, that all worked out fine. I did it for two weeks and then was able to put all my energy into company. And now you, uh, you played Jenny, who is known for smoking pot. Now, this was 1970. Yes, it was really... The, the year after Oh, Calcutta. Uh, Boy, you uh, did your homework. Uh, I don't... Really? The year after Oh, Calcutta. After now, how did people take a pot smoking? Well, it was interesting because it was kind of the... I became the authority on pot smoking. See, I could... You know, people would ask me if, <laughs> you know, if I had smoked because... It, Company made it okay, you know. I mean, hair. It was right. See, yeah. hair was dealing with with grass. Mm -hmm. um, but that was in a, you know, that was like young kids. But we were uh, like a a grown up couple. Didn't you say the f word also? No, I didn't say the f word. No? I said, I said, kiss my ass, you son of a bitch. Okay, this is I don't, cable. You can, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you can get away with that. <laughs> no, I don't think I said fuck. Okay. <laughs> oh, isn't that oh. wonderful on television? <laughs> Oh, I love it, I love it. Uh, no, it was funny because when we went to L.A., uh, Edwin Lester wouldn't let us say that. He wouldn't let us say, kiss my ass, you son of a bitch, <laughs> for Los Angeles Civic Light Opera. So Hal Prince was very clever. What we did was, was worse because he had me do kiss this, you know, which is oh, much yes. worse, much worse than saying kiss my ass, you son of a bitch. You got to do it in London as well. Yes, 
Yeah. Well, how was that experience? Oh, it was wonderful. I just last night. Oh, this has been such an incredible couple of weeks. I've seen so many friends. Last night, uh, I was with Donna McKechnie because um, uh, I've been staying with her a bit while I'm here, and uh, all of the my the friends from company are like some of my best friends really today. Uh -huh. You know, I'm having dinner with Elaine Stritch tonight. And we went to Charlie's and Steve Elmore came in. And so the three of us were sitting there and people said, oh, it's a company reunion. And we started talking about that time in London. And Steve uh, Elmore said, he said that was his happiest time in life. That's wonderful. Yeah. And it, wa it was incredible. We were treated wonderfully. Uh, the show was, of course, so wonderful. And... Uh, you know, we were. It was. It was a wonderful time. I just feel so, you know, rich for having gotten to have those experiences. Now that was your first original cast recording. There's a documentary about the making of Company, yeah. which is which is wonderful. Isn't that great? And this I, is when they recorded. Uh, it was with the orchestra, and uh, yeah, the re yeah. They, they lay tracks down now. Mm -hmm. But how was that experience? Is the documentary really representative? Oh yeah, that? they were so cl they were so clever because they they really made a drama out of it. They just had four cameras on us going all day. Of course, I was again young and naive and very stupidly got up, not knowing it. They were going to film it. I, I just hate. I, I I put on my stage makeup. <laughs> You see, I have these big eyelashes, and obviously I didn't do that today for this. <laughs> we tried to pull it together, but um, it's been a long two weeks. But anyway, I had on my, my thick eyelashes and all this makeup, and, and so I hate looking at the way I looked. But basically we forgot about the cameras because the, the purpose of the day was to do the album. So... They just filmed it, and you, you basically forgot about the cameras, and uh, as you know, a whole drama came out of they kept coming back on Elaine, and they, they, had, they had Elaine's song for the end of the, end mm -hmm. of the, the time, and of course it just didn't happen. It, it, you, know, it was, you see her do this incredible performance, and then they go, no, let's do but it again. But at three in the yeah. morning, are you thinking clearly, do you think? No, I don't think she was. <laughs> she, she later she said. She later said yeah. she looked like Margaret Rutherford doing the life of Judy Garland. Which yes, <laughs> which right. I just thought that. Right. Was she said after the first time she saw it, she said, oh, "It's not bad if you don't mind looking at a car wreck." I mean, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she was great about it. No, she just wore out, and and uh, no, she wasn't thinking clearly. And then, of course, what was so wonderful? She came back the de next day just looking terrific, and just it was just wonderful. Well, it's a wonderful documentary. It you is. also did Lightning Dust Strike Twice. You did a little night music as well. Yeah. And that's quite a different show. Yeah. It, I was, um, when I got, I was in London. I fell in love in London and thought I would just stay there until my money ran out. And then <laughs> after, after, you know, after I couldn't do company anymore there. So my money ran out and the, the romance ended. So I came back and um, I started doing, they, they were working on a little night music and I mean, this is just ridiculous. Because Follies had lost money, they actually had to do backers auditions for mm -hmm. to, for record companies for right, Little Night that's Music, right. which is I mean, Stephen Sondheim and Hal Prince had to do backers auditions. I mean, after company, you know, after all of their brilliant things. So they called me and asked me if I would do the uh, the the female songs. And Stephen did the male songs, and that was an, it was incredible because I'd be over and you know Stephen would play things for Hal Prince, and you know I'd be there. I mean I'd hear things for the first time. In fact, I was just uh, I had a wonderful evening with Stephen this past week, a wonderful visit, and he was he he mentioned about something about a song you've never heard, and I said oh yes because I was you know I heard heard some of the things uh, before anyone else heard them, and mm -hmm. that you know that was, that's wonderful memories because you know. Things go through changes. Stephen, I don't think, ever writes anything that is you would ever throw away. That's right. So some of these songs, uh, er, most of the things have been recorded, like uh, uh, for, for, were done with um, uh, Marry Me a Little, uh, uh, Twin Fairy Tales. And, and Silly People. Uh, silly People. Well, Silly People was in the show for a while. Actually, so was Twin, Twin Fairy Tales. That was in the show for a while. Um, a show called the number called one that was never in the show that was going to be the opening number but I did these uh, these backers auditions uh, and um, 
I wasn't going to be in the show. Hal always thought that I would, which, you know, which I am very American. And, you know, he always said I was his favorite cheerleader. And, of course, <laughs> <laughs> a little night music is, you know, it's European. It needs that European. Mm -hmm. And the part of uh, uh, Petra, I thought, you know, would be right, except, you know, I, I, I wasn't. You know, I mean, there was someone who was very right, but, you know, who did it, Garn Stevens, who mm -hmm. did it originally. And she had that, she just right, that well, European. that's what they say. And um, I wasn't going to be in it. And then... Th I got so involved doing the backers auditions, I said, oh, this is so frustrating because I want to be a part of it, and I'm not. But you did get in it, and you had an escape clause in your contract. Well, it wasn't an escape clause. It was just, it was just, they, they then asked me to do it, to be one of the Liebes leader, and they said they didn't know what it would be, but they wanted me to be in it, and so, so I said I would do it. And, but I wanted an out, you know, uh, anyway, they gave me a three-week out, because I said I wanted to go through the creative process and mm -hmm. be a part of it, but maybe not stay with it a long time, because I had just been doing company for two years, and mm -hmm. I, I needed to go out and do, I mean, I would come right to Broadway from college, virtually, I'd never done summer stock or regional theater. But Terry, you know they say there's a, there's a broken heart for every light on Broadway, when, Broadway, excuse me. Now, what kind of girl would give up a Broadway show to do a stock production of Annie Gets Her Gun? <laughs> Me! <laughs> For $225 a week. Well, it was in my hometown. <laughs> it was in Laguna. Oh, yes, I did that. I, I, but I did, I did night music for about six months. Uh -huh. Maybe, maybe four months. I left it in the summer. And then, yeah, people thought I was out of my mind. But I was young and naive, I keep saying that, but I was. And I never regretted it, really, because I got the experience of it. And then I went out, I w again, it's what I mm -hmm. wanted to do happened. I was so blessed, because I then spent the next two years doing regional theater and summer stock, which is, I, I did one role after another. That must have been quite an education. Oh, it was. I had to see if I could still act, because I had been, you know, I had done two musicals right in a, way, right in a row, and uh, granted the best, you know, the best theatrical time of my life, really. I mean, my God, the first four years on Broadway with Stephen Sondheim and Hal Prince. But, but then I went out and I started directing. I spent a couple seasons at the Actors Theater of Louisville, and I directed Jacques Brel there. Mm -hmm. and, and I went to uh, the Cincinnati Playhouse and did Tartuffe with Austin Pendleton. That was great. And Danny Sullivan directed it, who, you know, directed I'm Not Rappaport. Yes. Danny's an old, we, we were in school together back at San Francisco State. And I went did up to Maine and did, you know, all of some bunch, a bunch of those great, you know, Sally Bowles and Fiona, a bunch of great, with the great roles. And, and uh, Hartman Theater where I hooked up, I did uh, Tom Jones, which is where I met Barbara Damashek. That's right. Which then, you know, this, which is affecting my life greatly now because I got involved with Quilters uh, at the Denver Center where it was created and, and did that there and in Edinburgh Festival and uh, at the Huntington Hartford in L.A. And then I've been directing it. So it's been kind of getting, got me back into uh, doing more directing. Now, how has that changed your perspective on, on your acting? <laughs> well, probably that I will never act again. <laughs> no, auditions, I should say, make me think I'll never put myself through that again. I've just been through through auditions in L.A. because I'm I'm going back to direct the Octet Bridge Club in Los mm -hmm. Angeles, and so I've been through two weeks of of, of auditions, and. Uh, Oh God! You know it, what what people go through, what what we go through, and being on the other side of it. You know, I mean, it's just there's. I tried to figure out a way. That nobody has figured out any other way. I try. I let everyone do monologues, and I gave everyone a lot of time monologues and read from the play. And I called everybody that didn't get it. And, mm -hmm. You know, all of those things that I would would like. But I and I saw like 125 people. You know, for eight roles. And I've got submissions for about 400, you know. Wow. It's, it's, but, no, actually, I learn, I learn a great deal. What's really been nice in the last, I'd say the last year, two years, well, basically the last year, uh, it's been like every other thing. Uh, I directed Quilters and then did Folly. You know, I mean, it's been an mm -hmm. acting thing and then a directing thing. And I learn tremendously from each thing I do. What's, what I love is that I'm always ready to do the next thing. Once I've directed something, it's such a luxury to be able to go in and just be there and be directed and let them do everything, and I just have to worry about 
you know, my part in the whole. And then after I do that, then it's kind of nice to be able to go and be in charge. <laughs> now, uh, you have been in situations where you have not been in charge at all. Uh, one case in point is the baker's wife. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> 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 yes, oh, God, that's enough to make me fall on the floor. Um, yes, no, I was not in charge at all. Uh, nobody was, anybody nobody in was in charge at all. <laughs> nobody home. No, lots of people in charge and nobody in charge. That was... Um, that was eight months. Of, that's why I went to move to California. <laughs> that's what did it. I didn't <laughs> want to do that anymore. I did not for a while. I didn't want to do that anymore. Yeah, we were eight months on the road, and they just kept extending it and extending and it. And replacing people. Oh, and taking people up on charges, and it was so ugly. There was so much ugliness that went on. It was but that survives on record. That was one of the first... Uh, flop shows that, that has been recorded. <laughs> you know you know those people that the recorded yeckos? the yeckos they're, <laughs> they're <endorsed> vultures. <laughs> it's hysterical. We, they are they are vultures because <laughs> when we were on the, my next flop was was home again yes. and they came around inside Coleman and said, Oh my God, they're here. That means we're gonna be a flop. <laughs> I mean, you know, the, they come around like this, you know, yes. when when they sense the show is gonna be a flop <laughs> and we all thought, Oh my God, they are, were here are they wanting Oriental? to well, she is, and he isn't. Because <laughs> I, I talked to her on the phone, wanting to know when some record was coming out. Yeah. Like, oh, she, boy, did I get a song and a dance. Oh, like, Are well, they still doing that? Yes. Well, th you know, thank God for them. They have, they have put on record some wonderful things that we'd never have. I'm very grateful, you know. Well, let's talk about Home Again, Home Again, just briefly. Now, this is, uh, I, I think Russell Baker described it in, in an interview as a, sort of a musical Our Town, uh, taking place over 50 years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. I'm glad you. I never saw that. Identify that's, that's that. That's good. That's good. I w yeah. Now Lisa Kirk was a casualty there, mm. and uh, she was also one of the headliners. Mm. And one of uh, the pieces I read said when she left, so did her role. Her role. Her role left as well. <laughs> which made me. I don't think, know which wow. happened first. <laughs> <laughs> they went. They went together. Yeah. I yeah. They. They. they uh, that was painful. Those are painful things. Because she was, she was, she was very good in it. It just, it, it was just a part that didn't need to be. You mm -hmm. know, it just. Oh dear. Oh. But when you're going through a situation like that, where you might be the next one out the door, how do you maintain your level of? of I I never felt I would actually. I was in pretty, pretty. Of course, who knows what was going on? You know. See, the thing is, after Baker's Wife, mm -hmm. everything was a piece of cake. This was like everyone was going through their 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 hysteria over it, and I was just calm and cool because after Baker's Wife, this was a piece of cake. Um, <laughs> it it never quite had a concept, and it was all of these wonderful people. As was Baker's Wife, you know. I mean, I must say, you know, the cast of Baker's Wife. I just back back up a minute. You know, were incredible. Mm -hmm. It was just incredible. You know, Keen Curtis and. And, it, you know, of course, Topol was his first American show, and and uh, just wonderful people. But somehow these things go amiss. Now, now, Home Again had a wonderful score. Baker's Wife had a wonderful score. Um, I, I never felt with Baker's Wife that the collaboration was quite, you know, I felt th th there was one story going on which was being based closely on the, on the movie, and I felt Stephen's score was more, uh, a more romantic story mm -hmm. than than the original Baker's Wife story, and I think Joe Stein had written a book that went along with the movie more. So they were never quite in sync, is my feeling, you know. And 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 Home Again um, was pieced together because Cy Coleman had found, you know, had musicalized a number of Russell, and of course Russell Baker's Baker is brilliant, you know. And uh, it just never it never gelled. But I was the leading lady in that, and my position, and, and the Anita Morris, Morris and I were the only mm -hmm. two women that ended up on it, in it. Of course, Dick Sean, crazy Dick, wonderful Dick Sean, Ronnie Cox, and uh, it was this wonderful group of people, Gene Sachs. But it just never, never materialized. And now you know they're doing a, a, a making of the musical, uh, thir Thirteen Days of Broadway. Is that the name of it? I think so. Yeah. <laughs> I said, I, I talked to Cy and I said, I want to know who's playing me. <laughs> because the la leading lady is usually the one who gets. <laughs> mm -hmm. But I don't, I think they, what's even worse is that I don't think they found me interesting enough to, <laughs> to, to get me, you know, to get me. I think it was going to be other uh, elements of the creative staff. 
Oh, well, I guess that's there. One was. of the things that Russell Baker said, I always remember that I loved, we were standing in the back of the theater in Toronto, and he said, uh, he was kind of standing around, and he said he's discovered that going to the theater on the road for is a for the playwright is like going to the water cooler for a newsman. <laughs> <laughs> I just love that, the that's procrastination. Terry, our time is up. You're kidding already? So soon. Oh! But you'll have to come back on. when you come back to New York. I will, thank I you. So I enjoyed it. You know, it. you said earlier about someone, you ask a question, they just keep moving. I've talked an awful lot. <laughs> That's okay. You're not as tired as you think. <laughs> no. Thanks thank for stopping you. by. It's so nice to meet you. You too. I'm Ryan Keating, and you've been watching Spotlight. Our guest today has been Terry Ralston. Spotlight airs Tuesday evenings at 8.30 on Channel D and Wednesday mornings at 1 a.m. on Channel C and again 11.30 a.m. on Channel C on Saturdays. If you have any comments or suggestions, you can write to myself in care of Pierrot Productions, 640 10th Avenue, New York, New York, 10036. Until next week, this is Ryan Keating. Have a good week. Well, thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Boy, it went by. We're